my friends here have invited the Lord and said yes to the call of God in one of the most painful ways possible. They've said yes to the Lord, and I've seen God's favor on their life in the midst of pain. Let's clap. Josh, Christina, Marlo, here we go. Thank you. Uh, my name's, again, Josh. This is my wife, Christina, and we've been married now for almost 18 years, so it's a miracle, I know. Um, shortly after we got married, we had some friends that we respected a lot come over to our place and say, hey, we are going to adopt from Ethiopia, and we were like, well, that's interesting. Tell us more about them. They explained you know, what the process was like for them and why they were doing it choosing to go that route over having biological children, which was interesting. It planted some seeds in our heart at that point. And we didn't really talk about it too much right then, but over the next couple of months, it came up again, and we started to both realize that God wanted us to do this. God was calling us to adopt. And at the time, we knew that we had that call, but we also were operating in this... Um, in this realm of we still knew what was best for us and what that meant, what that would look like, you know, setting parameters around it. So we knew that um, we were terrified that if we had a child placed in our home, that if they were taken from us and, and reunited with their parents, that that would devastate us, that we wouldn't be able to handle that. So we knew, okay, we're not doing foster adopt. No way, not happening. And we are probably not doing private adoption either because we'd heard some stories where that had gone south. So not doing that. So that left international. So okay, all right, all right we're going to go international adoption. Because that's so easy. Because you know. very easy, yes. We knew we wanted a baby, you know, as close to a baby as possible because of all of the studies showing developmentally, you know, the earlier you get them, the more you love them, the better they are, right? So we knew, okay, it has to be a baby. It has to be from overseas. Only one. Only one. We're not doing, we're not doing multiple at a time. You know, we knew, we, we knew we wanted to adopt three, we thought at the time. We're going to do one biological and adopt three. That was the plan. Yeah. Plan everything out, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so we start down this process. We do, you know, we go biological first. So the day before our son Luke is born, we submit all the paperwork that we need to so that we're officially in the process to adopt from Ethiopia. And at the time they say, this is about an 18 month to two year process before you're going to be matched and be able to, you know, bring home a baby. So like, perfect, works great with our plans. This is exactly, every, everything's working exactly the way that it's supposed to. And we get through that first year of waiting, and you know the, the agency is constantly sending updates of everyone who's being matched with the kids. The kids are coming home. You're getting, oh, great, great, we're moving up the queue. It's almost, you know, it's going to be our turn soon. And right about that year mark is when rumors start coming out that things are slowing down in Ethiopia because of corruption. There were babies being sold into slavery, people that were buying them and taking them internationally and putting them into bad places. And it caused a lot of heartache for us. You know, we don't want that happening to babies, but it also slowed down the process significantly where the government was getting involved and saying, hey, we need to, to get this corrected. And so it came to an almost complete halt where there were no more stories coming in of babies. Or if, there was, if, if someone was, it was very, very rare that we would hear that that was happening. So... After two years of waiting, we say, okay, we don't want a big gap between our kids, so we go biological again. So Eliana then comes to be in our family. And then three years goes by, four years goes by. We get into the fifth year, and the whole country closes completely. And they say, there is no more international adoption coming out of this country. And we're like, okay. Okay, I mean, and we're waiting that whole time, thinking, like, when is this going to happen? Like, we feel like God has called us to do this. We're supposed to be doing this. And when the door closes, we're like, God, did we hear you correctly? Is this what we're supposed to be doing? Are we supposed to be adopting and, and praying about it and thinking about it, talking about it? We're like, yes, we are supposed to adopt. But internationals close. We look at all the other countries, and at that point, it's seven-year waits. It's, you know, five-year waits. You know, it's, you know, for a healthy child, you're not you're not looking at any kind of short time frame. So international is now closed. We don't have the funds for private adoption in the U.S. at that point. And that leaves one door, the, one, the first one that we had closed, right? Foster to adopt. And so we say, okay, God, 
we are going to try this. So we put in our paperwork for that, go through the home study. This is August, August of after, the, after five years. We do that in August. In September, we start getting calls from the adoption agency that we're using with potential matches. In October, they say, hey, we have got a sibling set. We know you only wanted one, but we've got a sibling set. One's two, the other's a baby, and we're thinking, okay, this could work, this could work, you know, with, our, with the ages of our kids. Um, but th that's all they know. We don't know if they're boys, girls, we don't know anything about them. And so they say, okay, well, here's the house of the current foster placement they're in, you can go check them out. And so we go to meet them, and the first boy we meet, he's almost three, full of energy, awesome, seems like a happy kid, but he knows five words at three years, almost three years old, he knows five words. The other boy, the baby, is 15 months, bigger than the almost three-year-old. <laughs> no baby, won't make eye contact, drooling, can't crawl. Like, he can't even crawl at this point. For those who know, at 15 months, you should be moving, right? And so we do a couple more visits with them. The social worker is like, hey, th there might be some, some issues here, special needs with the youngest one. We don't know. Um, but we say, you know what? When we were praying about it, talking about it, we say, God, if it's meant to be, if this is who we're supposed to have, it will work out. Whether, whether and we're going to trust that they are going to develop the way they're supposed to. If they don't, we, this, if that's who we're supposed to have, that's who we're supposed to have. At this point, we're changing our whole tune of being in control and saying, this is who it's supposed to be. So I'll let Christina take over. Yeah, so anyway, we ended up with the opposite of what we said. Um, but it was honestly the best thing that ever happened to us. The hardest season for sure that we had to walk through. Um, but talking about the breaking is breaking off the things you thought things were going to look like when you walk into a call and accepting what it's actually going to look like. And there was a lot of chaos. And you'd often hear people say, well, like, you just follow God and just follow that peace. And where God is, there will be peace. Well, where God is in foster care, there's often, or adoption, there's often a lot of chaos and heartache and trauma. It's not all peace, um, but God's still there. So God's in you with it um, in the chaos. And we saw God come through even when we felt like we were breaking, our marriage was breaking, our kids were breaking, I was breaking. We thought, we, we're not going to make it through this. Like, the kids are probably going to be reunified. Ours was a reunification case, so we knew that they were going to be going back to their birth parents, but we still were like, can we come out of this okay at the end? We don't know. But we saw God come through in such an incredible way. Through our community, people would drop meals off, text us encouragement, come and say, we're going to watch your kids so you can just spend time together. Um, so don't underestimate when God puts someone on your heart to reach out to them. That it, it could be the difference between them feeling hopeless and giving them hope. Um, and also something else that was so important is being in community. Our biological daughter um, at one point had kind of shut down because the older boy was very chaotic and aggressive and all the things. So she had kind of gone from being very fun-loving and social to quiet and withdrawn. And I thought, like, she's not coming out of this. I can't pay attention to my other kids because we're focused on these kids who have all these needs and therapy appointments and all the things. Um, and we were at a community group meeting, and one of the leaders came up to me after and said, you have a daughter, right? I said, yeah. He said, I saw her playing by herself in her room, and I felt like God wanted me to tell you that even though you're not able to play with her, Jesus is playing with her. And that was what got me through that season of feeling like I was neglecting so many of my kids because there was so much going on is I knew God was with us even in the messy, in the broken, in the chaos. And that's where in your community, when you feel like you don't have faith for something, they'll have faith for you. When, we, when you feel like you can't pray for something, they're going to pray it for you because you don't feel like you can in that season because you're so, you're in that dark place. And when you feel like you can't even hear God's voice because there's so much going on. They're going to hear it for you and speak that into your life. So if you're not in community, I just want to encourage that because that's what got us through um, this crazy season. And uh, I want to um, take this opportunity. If you're a foster or adoptive parent, can you just stand up really quick? I know there's some of you in here. <laughs> Please stand up. We want to honor you guys. And I just want to pray. Um, if you can extend your hands to them, please. Extend your hands to these um, families. Put your hands on them if you're nearby. 
God, we lift up these couples, these families who have said yes when other people didn't want to say yes to broken things. They gave away the thought of having a normal family or normal kids, and they said yes to different, and that's okay. Different is beautiful. And I pray for their marriages, God, that you would strengthen them. We pray for their families, all of their children, God, that you will knit them together in a way that we can't see and we didn't know was possible. We pray for their futures, God, that you are raising up these men and women uh, to be lights in the world and touch areas that we're never going to walk in this church, but they're going to be influencers, God, for your kingdom. We thank you for them. We pray a blessing over these families and parents, God, and thank you for their yes, because that yes was hard and it cost something. In Jesus' name, amen.